Heather Davis is an assistant professor of culture and media at the New School in New York, whose work draws on feminist and queer theory to examine ecology, materiality, and contemporary art in the context of settler colonialism. Her new book from Duke University Press, Plastic Matter, explores the transformation of geology, media, and bodies in light of plastics saturation. Davis is a member of the Extraordinary Synthetic Collective, an interdisciplinary team of scientists, humanities scholars, and artists who investigate and expose plastic pollution in the Great Lakes. Mark Simpson is a settler scholar and professor in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta, where he investigates U.S. culture, energy humanities, and mobility studies. He's a principal investigator for Transition and Energy, Culture and Society, a multi-year research project with Future Energy Systems at the University of Alberta. His work has appeared in South Atlantic Quarterly, Radical Philosophy, Postmodern Culture, and English Studies in Canada. In this conversation, Heather and Mark talk about how we are, in general, so saturated by an animated and often willfully hopeful communication style when it comes to environmental threats that it becomes easy to turn off and ignore the direness of present and future ecocide. We focus on figuring out what it could mean to adopt different communication strategies that are organized around conveying a sense of vulnerability, embodiedness, and kinship. If plastics are, in Davis's words, a much more intimate manifestation of oil and represent a major gap between, to quote Simpson, the experience of the unseen and the experience of the invisible, then it might be necessary to approach the problem using methods that aren't familiar, but that are actively defamiliarizing. Keeping in mind that their focus is on inquiring about what is not known about plastics, Heather points out that the timeline for plastics is actually incredibly undetermined and that we really don't know what we're doing fundamentally when it comes to the whole life cycle of plastics, from feedstock extraction to chemical processing to material production and distribution to degradation or dematerialization. The way Heather puts it is that, quote, we're fumbling around in the dark and in our hubris think that we're in control. Part of Mark's research focuses on how this hubris cannot be divorced from the unstable sense of mastery bred by petroculture. He's written about the simulated sense of smoothness that the energy regime of fossil fuels tries to maintain, even as it becomes more and more of a struggle to maintain it, as the obviousness of the truth of climate breakdown becomes apparent to us. There's a sort of circularity or stuckness that they say we're still reluctantly mired in. And plastics are a primary aspect of that. Plastic forms a barrier, a barricade, that lets us preserve a false sense that we are invulnerable, impermeable, protected. What recourse do we have, though, when the thing we use to control contamination is exposed as a major source of contamination? If people now increasingly understand that plastics fail to protect us from infection and contamination, and that they actively endanger our health, it's because of faith in plastics as a way of living in a bubble has been replaced by a sobering ecological knowledge of this petroleum product's toxic effects. And that knowledge is spread through activist organizing and by artists and theorists who allow us to sit with the world, as Heather puts it, to see it in a new way and shift our patterns of thinking. My first question has to do with um, communication strategy or maybe rhetorical method. Um, Heather, you note in your incredible book, Plastic Matter, uh, that you don't want to take the approach of merely stressing that the kind of sublime saturation of the world with plastic is sort of just interesting. And in, in doing that, kind of buy into this familiar discourse of revealing things or trying to inspire some level of epiphany at scale um, that's, I think, characteristic of a lot of podcasts, especially ones that relate to um, you know, science and, and technology. Instead, you say that you want to stress the shocking vulnerability that a plethora of plastics produces, the kind of Western style thinking that's led us to this kind of inflection point. And um, I would say also like these emerging forms of kinship that the condition you describe propels us into. Um, and so I guess my f first question is to you. Um, and it's just basically like, what is politically important to you about kind of trying to actively work against 
the sort of highly animated, generally quite hopeful, and even sometimes euphoric rhetoric of some environmental communication? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Um, thanks so much for asking. Um, I think that one of the things that I have really thought about is the ways in which, um, like how to actually create kind of communication styles um, that allow people both to take in information in a way that doesn't paralyze them, um, but also at the same time uh, doesn't kind of repeat the, the sort of sense of a kind of spectacularization of certain kinds of um, violence. So for example, like one of the things that I really think about a lot is, um, is you know, the, 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 the critique from the 1970s of Susan Sontag in relationship to um, the kind of ubiquity of certain kinds of, um, of imagery that often is kind of violent in relationship to, to journalism um, that tries to get people to be really animated or excited um, about a particular topic. And you know, those efforts, I think, are done with um, incredible goodwill, right? Like in the sense that people are only doing them um, because um, the situations are so desperate um, and they really do want governments and citizens to, um, and just folks in general, to to really be paying attention, to be able to shift the dynamics of whatever's happening, whatever's going on. Um, And I think to a certain degree, I think that that rhetoric can be helpful in relationship to um, environmental discourse, uh, but I think it also has the effect um, that Sontag noted all those many years ago of um, of increasingly kind of um, causing us to be desensitized to that kind of imagery, right? That I think that many of us are so saturated with that kind of communication style that it's easy for us at this point in time to be exposed to it and then to just kind of immediately turn off. And so I think that what I was um, interested in is how do we create a different kind of an understanding of that kind of level of saturation? Um, And one of the ways in which, you know, one of the reasons why I said, why, you know, I say in the book um, that I was interested in plastic to begin with is because it's a much more intimate manifestation of oil. Like I think that one of the problems with oil or fossil fuels more broadly, um, is that our interaction with them um, as uh, just people living the world is often quite abstracted. Um, But with plastics, we do have very intimate relationships with different forms of petrochemicals, and uh, plastics are very highly among them. So I think that that to me is like provides a different kind of an opening um, for thinking about those relations. Um, And in particular, um, thinking about what did, what would it mean if we if we thought about them um, not only as abstracted but also as um, as as materials that we are deeply enmeshed with and that we have a certain kind of responsibility for and towards, um, which doesn't mean <laughs> that um, that I think that it's actually consumers' responsibility for. Um, the the problems of plastic waste and plastic pollution, but I do think that that because it's so ubiquitous at this at this moment in time, um, I do think that maybe in terms of communication strategies, in terms of being able to talk about plastics, um, I want there to be to be remaining a certain kind of openness and at the same time a sense of um, a necessity for responsibility and 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 response. Um, so that's the reason why I suggested. Um, these other kinds of communication strategies, like the sense of vulnerability, the sense of embodiedness, um, and even at some points, the sense of um, kinship. And I understand also that, um, you know, some folks have sort of said that that the ideas of kinship have been overused or have been um, too kind of appropriated from Indigenous cultures. Um, and I definitely hear those critiques Um At the same time, I want to emphasize that the reason why I use that term in relationship to plastic is because I do think of them as a kind of offspring of, um, you know, 20th century chemical companies uh, of which myself and many other people are very intimately bound. And so and so for me, it's a useful term in that regard. And it also, I think, replies. like captures a sense of bounded responsibility, whether you like it or not, right? Like I think that, you know, even if you're estranged from your family, from your biological family or, or, or those kinds of kinship structures, there's a sense of 
um, boundedness um, that is that is at work or at play there um, that can be uh, very um, harmful, but also I think can be useful. And I think that that's what I was trying to kind of get at is that like even if we're bounded up with these things that we would really rather not have in our lives, um, there there's still a sense of responsibility towards them. Yeah, absolutely. And I can see sort of two different ways of thinking about responding to what you were saying there. Um, but I guess I wanted to give you a chance, Mark, to jump in if you if you had anything you wanted to add on that thread. I, I do. So so thank you, Heather, for that really rich answer. And one of the things that <clears throat> that strikes me as as I hear you sort of talking about the decision to focus on plastics and plastic uh, rather than, for instance, oil is um, is the the sort of relation between and the distinction between the invisible and the unseen. And what I hear in the answer that you've provided, Heather, about sort of the 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 intimacy of plastic is a really compelling distinction, but also articulation between oil and plastic, which I might I might articulate as oil is unseen to the extent that it's relatively absent and abstract. And, and so therefore, so oil is given <laughs> to the extent that it's unseen and it's in its abstraction or its absence, whereas plastic is given because it's unseen in its sort of, it's sort of interminable presence. It's everywhere and always with us in ways that lots of people don't encounter oil, uh, except when they fill up the car, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think that that difference then that that difference of the the givenness as a givenness of interminable presence rather than a givenness of relative absence uh, feels like it has it it opens up particular possibilities methodologically for addressing the the complicated knot of the invisible and the unseen with respect to petroculture. So I, I really and and hearing you articulate that those choices in that way sort of drives home sort of why I think the, the book you've written is just so remarkable. Yeah. And I see you in the book, for example, you know, responding to Robin Wall Kimmerer, noting just sort of the um, invisibilized kind of ubiquity of plastic, too, and like trying to wrap your head around that this idea that, you know, like, yes, plastics are a more intimate relationship or, or kind of imply a more intimate relationship maybe to oil's permeation of everyday life. Um, but due to their kind of um, that level of saturation, they do become sort of invisible to some extent. So yeah, I, I definitely want to come back to that question of um, visibility in, in our kind of, you know, built environment as it were, or within infrastructures. But um, maybe if I could before that, I wanted to talk about kind of like, making visible um, a history of energy as a strategy. Like there are moments in plastic matter where Heather, you drop these like stunning facts that I just wasn't aware of, you know, like the fact that the periodic table has a kind of politics <laughs> or that celluloid, which is so strongly associated now with filmmaking was originally conceived as a substitute material for making billiard balls or that um, to quote the book, uh, the first plastics were developed without a basic understanding of their molecular structures. Um, like that latter thing reminded me of Kara Daggett's discussion in The Birth of Energy of the kind of novelty of energy. The fact that the first engines were kind of black boxes in a sense. Their, their dynamics weren't really fully understood, nor was the fundamental fact of entropy. Um, and I point these things out to basically, I guess, ask you about what you found most surprising maybe in writing the book. Uh, what became visible to you, uh, either in terms of like common misconceptions about plastic or just in terms of like the strange history of plastics? Yeah, I mean, um, thank you both for those um, wonderful comments. It's um, really gratifying to hear that the book has been resonating with um, both of you. But um, but to answer your um, question, Scott, I mean, I guess like, you know, one of the fun things about researching plastics is there's sort of like an endless like there's, it felt a little bit like there was a sort of endless trove of weird facts about plastics um, mm -hmm. that like to dive into. And I think that that was kind of really fascinating and interesting. I mean, I think for me, one of the things that I did find um, that really kind of undid my own understanding of plastics when I first really started 
thinking about them was really like this kind of question of the timeline because part of part of I think what compelled me to write the book in the first place and in some of my earlier writings on plastic um, you know I talk about I think that and a lot of people have a kind of general sense that, that plastics are, are completely um, non-decomposable and um, and that we and that because of that they're going to exist for you know multiple thousands of years into the future and that seemed to be um, very unclear actually as as I was kind of like moving through the research that like that Mm. the timeline for plastics is actually incredibly undetermined and I think that one of the things that that really illustrated that to me although in this case it wasn't so much that the plastics were they weren't decomposing they were just uh falling apart um which I think is a whole other problem of, of plastics but um, but uh, and that I think has to be differentiated because um, those two mechanisms on a chemical level are incredibly different. But but mm-hmm. um, but I think that the sort of the, the fact of, of plastics falling apart very rapidly, I think, is um, is something that I hadn't totally considered when I first started doing it. And the, the first time this really became apparent was. I had the opportunity to go down to the Smithsonian Museums in Washington. And one of them, there was um, in the, the the material archivist there was showing us these um, model planes from World War II that had spontaneously started breaking apart. And what I mean by that is they were essentially kind of like mini explosions. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the, the chemical bonds for whatever sets of reasons after being around for like just under 100, like, you know, about 70 years or so, just kind of, you know, broke apart in this kind of spectacular way where the bits of these model airplanes um, were then kind of scattered, you know, over two or three or four feet across, across the museum displays. And this was, you know, a huge problem, obviously, for the um, archivists uh, there. Um, So I think that that is, has been like one of the, the really surprising things. I mean, I think that there's just, there's so many surprising things that, that one runs up against and into um, when mm-hmm. it comes to plastics, and I think that that one of the kind of real lessons about that is that we really have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. it's like you know we've saturated the globe with this with these sets of of petrochemicals that are not actually at all at all the same, um, and they have very different characteristics and properties. And I think that I think that maybe that's another thing is that like, you know, I didn't realize how kind of divergent plastics were um, as a set of materials. I didn't quite understand that. I think that I have a much deeper understanding of that now. Um, But really like what they're doing on a kind of global scale and to whom under what conditions, I think like in terms of, you know, their temporal, um, their kind of timelines or or lifetimes in terms of their um, potential for, for decomposition, in terms of their potential for remaining a kind of concrete or discrete object in terms of, you know, in terms of all of these different things, even the, even the ability now to be able to really create different kinds of plastics. Um, even now that we do have incredibly robust uh, models for what polymers do and how to be able to manufacture them, there's still a way in which um, it's a little bit like we're fumbling around in the dark or like, or that, you know, we're, we're kind of like speaking in a language with only maybe like three letters or something like that. There's a, a, such a kind of reduction to the possibilities of those things, because I think that that our hubris often moves far beyond what we're actually capable of. But then but then the consequences of that are so like fundamentally unknown, which isn't to say that there are isn't a lot of harm that we do actually know about. But um, but just as just to kind of as a reminder that that um that there's just so many things that are so strange when you start encountering plastics in the world of the worlds of its manufacture and um, production and dissemination. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you say our hubris, but it's, it's the hubris, as you point out of a very particular kind of groups of people um, and, and the kind of um, creation of an orientation to the land that is deeply kind of Western and European and settler colonial um, and so, yeah, I mean, this idea of, despite our sense of a certain kind of mastery that comes in part from the pliability of plastics, it's like um, undermined by the fact that, you know, no one has stopped to consider the consequences necessarily, or if they did, they suppress the information regarding the consequences so as to make a profit. 
So yeah, you know, both of you write really sharply about the ways that plastics are not innocent technologically or ideologically. Uh, Mark, you write in a new piece that plastics are defined by this condition of becoming anything in our imaginary. Um, and this and that this malleability quote affords the determination of everything. So I, I wondered if either or both of you wanted to elaborate on this sense of plastics kind of creative force, uh, as you call it, Heather, this idea that part of the appeal is a perception of infinite pliability and mastery. I can I can only say that I think, you know, what you just said, Heather, about the the strangeness of plastics and the and the sort of the weirdness of a history in which uh, the ostensible powers of chemical mastery actually unleash things that we don't begin to comprehend and that really outstrip us has an is an interesting feels like it's an interesting fold on this problem right that if the if you know if a certain kind of ideological uh, desire or fantasy about plastic is that it it produces a kind of pliability, you know, apart from nature or over nature, and in that you theorize so wonderfully in terms of uh, synthetic universality. Uh, it, it's interesting then that, you know, it, one of the potentially malign geniuses of plastic is that its creativity is something that outstrips the capacity of the human to fantasize its, its mastery. Yeah, I mean, I think that like Mark, actually, you put it so beautifully in that article about like when you say that the whateverness of plastic is what makes it unique, and I think that like that is such a, a like a profoundly um, condensed and like it really puts into language. I think when it, like a lot of the the problems of what we encounter when we encounter plastics and the kinds of fantasies um, that I've argued um, are embedded in that kind of a material um, and that I do see as extending uh, in all kinds of different ways. And I have to say that, you know, a lot of my thinking around this has really come from um, Bernadette Bensaud Vincent in, in her writings around um, plastic and the relationship of plastic to um, techno science and to techno utopias in particular. And it's, you know, just being um, that thinking about that in relationship to the kinds of histories of, of settler colonialism, it seems like there's a real continuity between the ways in which um, whiteness, for example, also could be figured as a kind of whateverness um, uh, that makes it unique, right? Like that the ways in which the kind of ubiquity or universality of, of how whiteness comes to be produced in the world, um, how white supremacy then comes to be produced in the world, has a kind of relationship to the ways in which um, plastic also comes to occupy this this kind of non-identitarian identity um, that then gets produced and proliferated everywhere, um, which I really do see as kind of originating, um, you know, in the kind of moves of, of the beginning of colonialism, although uh, I'm sure uh, maybe historians <laughs> might, uh, might take some issue with that, but um, I'm not a historian, I'm a theorist, but, uh, but, mm -hmm. that, um, but that I do think that there's like a kind of a relationship um, that gets built uh, through that take on the world that can produce um, yeah, this kind of synthetic universality or this way in which uh, there's something both defined and undefined at the same time. Um, and also that, that the kind of fundamental orientation to the world around us is not really one of engagement or reciprocity or thinking about um, what our obligations are or what are kind of like engagement is in a kind of multi-generational sense, uh, but rather is always about a kind of immediate presentism um, and really thinking about um, how that is really bound up to a particular understanding of the material world as kind of given for us, right? A given for humans, given for a particular kind of white Western um, subject, that there is no sense of it being about um, respecting any kind of form, um, but rather about like, how can we push, how can we push, the, like how to, and by we, I guess, <laughs> I like mean like people like me and my ancestors, like how, how did we push the boundaries of those things to become whatever we were interested in, regardless of the consequences, regardless even if those consequences were terrible for us, um, because in some sense that is what, what's happened. Um, 
but they weren't kind of immediately felt obviously in the same ways as they were to other folks, like especially black folks and indigenous folks. Um, what I do to try to articulate and what I um, continue to think is that this kind of idea of plasticity really um, predates plastic as a material, but then plastic comes to like be informed by all of these ideas, which is part of the reason why it takes the forms that it does in the world um, and has been able to be transmuted, transmuted and transmitted in the ways that it has been. Mm -hmm. To kind of, you know, uh, build from that, I guess I wanted to like, just underline this idea that it is that um, attachment to a certain notion of mastery that is kind of coming back to overwhelm us in the present. I mean, you know, one of the things that I find so kind of uh, bridgeable or resonant in in the in your both of your um, you know kind of working through of the question of plastics is this like this idea that um, one of the major kind of promises of plastics is that it provides this preventive barrier, uh, a means of like preserving or fortifying oneself and one's things, one of the things that are proper to oneself in a kind of plastic bubble cut off, you know, from earthly decay and contamination. But the irony, I suppose, the, the tragic irony there is that um, the promise of a barrier means that we're like battered by the interminable decomposition or not quite decomposition, the breaking down of plastics and uh, the permeation of our bodies by it. So it's like, again, this kind of um, thing where like security and territory as a worldview leads to the production of plastics as a kind of sealant, um, but it's it's making those connections clear. And so I wondered if either of you wanted to speak to the sense that like, if we want to grasp the roots of our ongoing co-evolution with plastics, we really need a genealogy of these seemingly common sense commitments to like securing a safe separateness from the natural world. Yeah, I mean, um, I often think about this quote from James Baldwin, Baldwin, where he says that it's only white people who believe that they were safe to begin with. Hmm. And what I think he means by that, the way that I understood that is not that, that we don't all like as any kind of being strive for a certain kind of safety. I think that that is common to any any living organism. Um, but I think that what, what he means by that is that there's a kind of expectation of safety. Like there's um, an expectation mm. that, that one can build a kind of, and that, that, and that that expectation results in precisely the kinds of things that you're talking about, right? Which is um, a kind of fortress mentality or a kind of um, territory mentality. Um, I mean, another one of a couple of the, the things that I ran across when doing research on plastic that I think are so ironic and that hopefully, you know, Mark, I, I imagine you have a lot to say about this too, um, is the the use, for example, like, you know, Christy Robertson writes really beautifully about the use of petrotextiles um, to shield oil workers from the harms of, of, of the oil rig. So like, you know, in order to be able to work on an oil rig, you have to be you have to be um, closed in these materials that are covered in all kinds of petrochemicals that are often made from petrochemicals themselves. Um, and similarly, I think, you know, we, um, which seems just so deeply ironic or like, you know, similarly, mm -hmm. the ways in which we use, it's now um, not uncommon for, um, for there to be giant white plastic sheets put over glaciers in the Alps or in other places um, in order to protect um, the snow underneath from melting um, so that um, so that they can continue to be used as ski resorts. And Gosh. like and just the kind of like ironies of these systems are just like so kind of like oh. it's almost like you couldn't make this stuff up. Right. Like right. it just like it's just it just seems so circular and ironic um, or the ways in which like, you know, um, cribs are often um, especially in the United States are often like saturated in flame retardant materials um, like frame retardants as uh, you know obviously so that they don't go up in flames but but it's like the reason why they need to be saturated with those material with those chemicals in the first place is because the materials themselves are often made of plastics which are highly flammable so you know like like there's just there's just all of this kind of circularity I think when it comes yeah, yeah, yeah. to um, the use of of different types of petrochemicals 
as both this kind of desire for a kind of barricade that we under that as soon as we create a kind of barricade, it makes us intensely more vulnerable, but also much more paranoid about vulnerability. And there's mm-hmm. this kind of circular logic that then goes into that kind of um, increased sense of, of barricade instead of just kind of giving in to the fact that um, that we are, you know, fleshy <laughs> like beings that are going to die, that are per- like that, that we are like we're going to die, we're going to get sick, like that those are things that are fundamental to um, existence. And instead of like embracing that and seeing what the possibilities of that are, um, there's this, there's a kind of, um, there's a violence that's built into that denial. And I think that that is like part of what we're also seeing. Mm. I, I, I sort of love the reference to James Baldwin and it makes me also think of, of Kyle Poas White, who you also reference uh, several times in the book and, and the arguments about the problems with, uh, you know, normative uh, constructions of the Anthropocene and of, of ideas of climate crisis is that they don't sort of recognize that this is actually the inheritance of what was settler colonial utopianism. Uh, that was ongoing devastation for indigenous people for centuries. And it sort of, all of this makes me think about the, <clears throat> the way in which the, 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 the sort of the fantasy about a kind of separateness is an, an asymmetrically ascribed privilege. And also then the, there is a certain <laughs> asymmetrically inscribed privilege of discovering crisis, right? Which we, it feels like we're surrounded by now. Suddenly it's a crisis. Um, but the nature of that crisis is, of course, differentially produced and un, unequally born. And so one of the things that this leaves me wondering is whether uh, it's sort of uh, belated recognition is a privilege or not. That to me feels like that's an open question. But I, I don't know how one would begin to compose the genealogy of that, uh, you know, this common sense. I mean, that seems like a, do you have thoughts about that, Scott, ha- having posed the question? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it happens in this kind of piecemeal way. It, it sort of comes into um, form. And it's like interesting, Heather, in your book, you talk about like the brevity of the book, the fact that it is this kind of, you know, fairly short intervention, despite how uh, rich it is. And it's like interesting to think for me about like the way you end the book, which is, you know, where you're talking about trying to kind of, if not escape crisis, simulate and a, a kind of um, you know, off the grid, uh, experience of, you know, canoeing and taking in nature and so on. But like, even there, even in this moment of, um, kind of being abstracted from, uh, the petrocultural, just everyday grind, uh, the grimy grind of living in a petroculture, it's like, you're hyper aware in this kind of belated recognition that you're like shedding plastic into the environment. Um, so it's this whole thing, I guess, for me of like trying to do the right kind of genealogy, because like a, a history of plastics, you, you, you know, we'll have to get very shortly to the question of um, the role of public relations in perpetuating the kind of, you know, plastics regime or plas- the overproduction of plastics that we currently exist in. That is like one history. And I think, you know, Mark, in your work, you seem to be suggesting that there's like a way to historicize that, um, that gives us a comfortable sense that awareness itself is, is, um, you know, the point, right. Uh, that like, if we're, if we're recognizing it, then we're somehow doing something. But the, the truth of like both of your work is that you're really restless about that and, and, and make clear that like a close analysis of plastics production reveals that in fact, plastics don't protect us. Their proliferation is extremely dangerous. In your words, Mark, plastic is manifestly not just an obstacle, though, that we can bypass on our way out of pa- uh, petroculture. Plastic mires us. Um, and, you know, you're saying something similar in Plastic Matter, Heather, where you ask, what could possibly be said about such a terribly mundane material? How can it provoke thought beyond a shrug or exasperated scream at its unfathomable accumulation? Um, so like, to me, that's the kind of genealogy I'm interested in one of kind of tracking, uh, levels of acceptance and acquiescence to plastic, um, and, and the coming maybe recognition of the sheer ubiquity of it. I mean, 
this is where we're at in Canada, where, you know, like you point out again in the book that like an estimated 90% of, of the plastic that has ever been created is still somewhere on the planet. And now we're having kind of moment of belated recognition in this country where a newly implemented ban on certain plastic products in Canada has just come into effect um, after an enormous amount of industry pushback. Um, and, and there are some like serious limits to that ban. But I guess if, if we wanted to frame the question of how to do a genealogy of levels of like social acceptance, the, the question I would ask is like, does something like this, a mild reform, function primarily as a deflection, a deferral? Is it in any way a meaningful step, this kind of reform? Or is it like purely a deflection and therefore in some ways kind of dangerous, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's an excellent question. I don't, um, I would say I think it's, it's, it's mostly a deflection or a deferral, you know, because yeah, a lot of the things that we actually have to deal with. I mean, I think that, you know, there's that, that uh, statistic that, that it only really deals with 5% of single use plastic waste in the first place. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and doesn't really address at all. I mean, I think that for me, one of the really frustrating things is that um, the same answers that we've been pitched for many, many years, just keep recirculating, right? So like industry keeps yeah. on saying that they just need to have access to more recycling. Well, that's never been the problem, right? It's never no. been that there's been government legislation that somehow um, limits recycling access. The problem with recycling is that it doesn't actually work very well on a material level. Um, plastics are not easy to recycle. They, it doesn't happen very well for all kinds of reasons, um, including the fact that there's just so many, uh, many types of plastics. Um, and some like black plastics don't get seen by the sensors. And most plastics can only be recycled once or twice before the molecular bonds break down to the point at which um, they don't actually, can, you can't actually create the same objects again. And the fr really frustrating thing is that this, like when you go back to the even to the 1950s, when you look at the kind of like archival reports at that point, the industry was saying the exact same thing as what they're saying now. And it just feels like this is, I think, why, Mark, your, your theorization around the impasse and what the impasse is doing um, is actually so incredibly important because you're providing this like language um, through Berlin to like really think about the kind of the 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 kind of cognitive and physical and material stuckness that is then also allowing it to continue right like mm. not not only allowing it to continue but but exponentially increase right like mm -hmm. i mean i think what's been really disheartening actually um in the process of doing this research is that like you know when i started the book like a little, like about 10 years ago now and i started doing this research it was like there was very few people who were um, theorizing plastic. And then there was um, also not a huge amount of kind of public um, knowledge about the problems of plastic pollution. Um, and when they were, when it, when there was a kind of public acknowledgement of it, it tended to focus on the types of things that are now being banned um, by the Canadian government. Um, and then the problem with that is that it doesn't deal with any of the kinds of more real material problems of plastics, right? It doesn't actually deal with the fact that they're not easily recyclable, that, that, that um, single use plastics are obviously um, not made for that. And that, um, and that, and that th there isn't, they also, because they do tend to break down fairly readily, they also don't have much durability in the same way that like, you know, other kinds of objects made of different types of materials actually have longer life lifespans, like wood, for example. Um, and so this is the, this is the, the intensely frustrating thing about like looking at what's been happening is that like, despite the kind of rise in public awareness around this, which I think goes back to the, these questions that, that were circulating around, um, is like, in, despite the kind of rise in awareness, um, there has been no appreciable decrease at all. In fact, there's only been increase in the amount of plastics produced in the world. And so I think that it's like, if we're not dealing, just like, just as with fossil fuel production, it's like, until we start actually taking seriously things like leave it in the ground, it's like you can't actually get to any kind of real solution in relationship to plastic pollution until you have a real actual mechanism for the reduction of plastics in the, in the first place. And that also includes reducing the types of plastics that are being produced. And so 
I mean, I'm not sure if this if this ban does harm. I mean, maybe. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's a part of me that's like, well, at least it's something. Mm-hmm. Um, but I understand why people would would see it as a form of harm. I think that that I I think that that it can it can be harmful actually because one of the things is that once you have, um, you know, and I was reminded of this by um, Judith Enick who runs this or um, activist organization Beyond Plastics, who's like an incredible activist around these questions. And one of the things that um, one of the things that recently happened in New York State, which is you know where I live now, um, was that they were trying to push through a similar kind of totally ineffectual ban in the state. And, and the group actually called for its demise and effectively got mm-hmm. it squashed. And the reason being was because once you have something like that in place, it becomes incredibly difficult to then actually put in better legislation, like legislation around extended producer responsibility, for example, which, of course, there's nothing like that in this, um, in this Canadian bill that you're talking about. Um, and so, yes, potentially it is actually very harmful. Um, I think it really has that potentiality. Um, it certainly does nothing to address the kind of fundamental problems of of plastic pollution and its uh, dissemination. Mm-hmm. So, if it, I just it, one of the things that I'm sort of thinking as as we're talking is is the way in which the prospect of a of such a ban uh, turns on the 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 necessary continuation of the kind of misperception you're describing, Heather. For instance, that that plastic is in fact an incredibly sort of various and discontinuous sort of uh, ecology of substances <laughs> rather than a singular a singular thing and that it's like the plastic ban works and makes sense to the extent that we we continue to imagine that plastic is just one thing and that we can ban we can ban it uh, and that the consequence of the ban will do particular kinds of things rather than uh, you know, all sorts of forms of recycling won't manage all forms of plastic. But it also then makes me think that there's that this for me ties with the fantastic uh, sort of uh, argument you have in, in the I think it's the first chapter of your book, where you you observe that 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 the kinds of sort of the, the kinds of plasticity that you're describing constitutes what you call sustainability in the true sense. And it makes me think that, you know, right. here, the, the ban on plastic constitutes sustainability in the sort of familiar sense of we need to do more with less. But it's interesting to sort of think about how that's actually only always a supplement and a symptom of sustainability in the true sense, which you define as endless pliability. That is mm-hmm perpetuation of the same through whatever means are necessary, whatever pliant means we might have to hand. And it feels like the band does that work perfectly as a supplement to the perpetuation of the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that that turn is so interesting, that idea of sustainability is kind of interminability. And I was hoping that like in relation to that, we could sort of, um, and and also in relationship to what you were saying, Mark, around like, um, the perpetuation of these misconceptions, especially this misconception of plastics as one thing, as a uniform thing. Um, you know, uh, the, the thing that really stu- stood out for me, like I had never actually thought about something like Teflon or PTFE as a plastic. Mm-hmm. Like that's a plastic too. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm not sure that if you asked, you know, somebody with a nonstick pan, like, did you know that there's like plastic on your pan? They would be like, oh yeah, of course. Um, and, and it speaks to just sort of the, the, uh, the ways that we're kind of inoculated to the effects of plastics on the body. Um, and, and maybe that, that, that shrug that you talk about in relationship to like what is known and not known about these effects, it's just sort of like taken, um, in stride in some ways out of necessity because of the, the level of stuckness to just kind of frame this, like, uh, Mark, you, you write that in fact, scientists do not yet know the consequences for human health of this plasticization of tissue. Um, but that we should hasten a guess that it will be gravely damaging. Um, and it seems to me like Teflon, uh, PFAS, these things are actually now becoming sort of more, uh, visible despite it being known for a very long time that this extremely lucrative industry around like producing nonstick, uh, uh, surfaces on a variety of different objects um, is is super damaging. Like, 
there's now a growing sense of how uh, Teflon, super slippery for, forever chemicals have come into being. There's a way in which I think, um, given the state of overwhelming kind of crisis we we inhabit now, um, exposing this among other things, like it doesn't feel as though it like advances anything. And yet maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it, it's exactly what we need to be doing is like identifying this one ubiquitous substance as something that, you know, needs to be regulated. And if it were regulated, might um, have this kind of knock on effect where you've, you've seen the connection between, if not, you know, awareness and action, knowledge and regulation to be more specific. <laughs> That's less a question than a little bit of, a, I don't know what, a diatribe in relationship to the, <laughs> you know, ubiquitous problem of, of like PFAS, Teflon, which terrifies me, right? Mm. Um, but does anyone want to, do either of you want to speak to this question of, um, yeah, I guess, in a, again, making visible as a means of making possible some form of um, counteraction? Yeah, I mean, if I can just sort of quickly say, I feel like this is this is a terrific question, and and it's such a difficult question, and it mm-hmm. feels like it it sort of it it takes me back to the beginning where Heather you you uh, sort of invoke Susan Sontag, and then the the idea of a particular kind of uh, coming into awareness that then mm-hmm. sort of it, it is accompanied very quickly by a kind of closing off, and then sort of wondering what happens with that and what do we make of that and. I mean, one of the many marvelous things in your book is the the incredibly challenging and provocative way in which you invite your readers to dwell in the tension uh, between what you understand as a kind of embracing of the queer kinship that is sort of inevitable, given plastic, right, that is now now with us. Uh, and is a consequence of of particular kinds of social and cultural and 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 material practices that that some humans have vested on the world, um, and holding that in tension with the, the the need also to hold chemical companies to account. And I, I feel that it's so compelling a, a, as a kind of as a call to sort of dwell in that tension and to think about it. And I also realize that I struggle about what constitutes a kind of approach or a method through which we might be able to do that if the making visible method doesn't seem, despite decades of attempting in various contexts to do so, to have much traction. I don't know what that does. Mm-hmm. Anyway, and so that in a way, this kind of returns me to the question about sort of sort of uh, modes of communication that that launched the first question, and that you know, sort of how how particular practices like scholarship do that kind of work, and then how other kinds of things like the synthetic collective Heather, which I wanted to ask you about, might mm-hmm. do that kind of. Work. Yeah, I mean, I think that actually, like, Mark, what you're saying for me is really actually very important, which is that, like, I think that one of the one of the things that I think that you can do in scholarship or in art production, for example, is that um, in both of those uh, forms, there's an ability, I think also in in literary forms as well, there's an ability to hold ambiguity together without having to generate a particular kind of response. And I think that that's important because I think it allows us to sit with the world as it is. I think it allows us to see the world in a different way. I think it shifts our kind of patterns of thinking um, that can be very, very important. Um, On the other hand, I don't think it does the work of what activism does. I think that those are two two kind of like separate modalities and I think that you know the work that I've done with um with the synthetic collective definitely has a bit more of an activist orientation um specifically with certain kinds of things that we've done together um such as you know creating maps or creating lists of um every single known um chemical associated with the production of plastics um every single um plastics manufacturing company um that that is in around in and around the great lakes region um also uh doing actual uh, scientific analysis of all of the pre-production plastic pellets that are released directly into the great lakes um which mm-hmm. you know i mean it's like the kind of scientific study where you're like oh look we set out to prove the thing that we already knew um which was that they tend to 
um, conglomerate around industry and then also around big cities. Um, but it's important to have that kind of data because I think that um, policymakers don't really pay attention to that stuff unless you can show them that kind of data. So I think that, you know, and part of the reason why we, we decided to do that study first was because it really seemed like low hanging policy fruit. And as far as I understand, um, there was a shift in at least industry standard um, to no longer uh, just flush uh, plastic pre-production plastic pellets down the drain. Um, although, you know, there isn't a lot of um, accountability measures for that. So what it, you know, how it's actually being implemented is a whole other question. But one of the, one of the other things that I was thinking about as you were talking, sorry, there's a number of thoughts in my head at the same time, but one of the other interesting things that I was, I was thinking about as you were talking is, you know, Marina Zirko put together this really beautiful book called Petroleum Manga, where she like grouped together all of these objects, um, like in a kind of manga, they're all drawn um, by their chemical composition. And it's really fascinating to see like what is made out of polyethylene, what is made out of styrofoam, what is made out of, you know, all of these things, because they're not necessarily things you would necessarily think of together. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the fact that, you know, the fact of our, um, of the fact, the fact that not many people have that kind of chemical literacy, I think, is one of the difficulties of addressing um, plastic toxicity. Um, and um, but one of the interesting things about um, about um, plastic uh, PFAS is um, the movements around that. I think have been really strong in linking plastics pollution to environmental racism. Mm -hmm. And to the, and to also to class issues as well. And I think that that to me is actually really necessary because I think that one of the things um, that's frustrating sometimes when you look at kind of environmental movements around um, plastic pollution is that there is a real um, emphasis on the consumer. Um, and there's also a real emphasis on just like avoiding or not buying certain products, which I think, again, is just about consumer habits and individual choices. And it's deeply frustrating to me that that, that, that continues to be um, something that, that certain types, certain kinds of, of plastics um, environmental organizations um, put out in the world instead of actually looking at their deep, deep connections to um, questions of settler colonialism and white supremacy. And when you actually look at something like PFAS, the ways in which um, that's been mobilized has been mobilized precisely through kind of environmental justice lenses. And I think in that regard, um, it's actually really important that, that people are starting to look at, um, at, I mean, obviously for real reasons, because it's also um, highly carcinogenic as a material um, and has been linked to all kinds of birth defects. And um, it's, it's a very troublesome material, uh, much more so than some of the other um, plastics. But, but, um, but mm -hmm. I think this link between, between that and environmental justice is really strong in a way that, that when you're thinking about, um, you know, plastic lids for coffee cups, the, 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 the link is like not as obvious. And I think mm. that um, if we reframe if we reframe the ways in which we're thinking about why plastics pollution is so harmful and what it is that we need to be addressing, there's a possibility for coalition building that is not possible um, if we just think about it in terms of like consumer um, desire or consumer awareness or, or the effects on the consumer. Right. And, and reducing it to consumer sovereignty in the way that uh, the plastics industry has in relationship to recycling, that really it's just about educating consumers to sort of, um, yeah, be more responsible, better at managing risk and so on. Yeah, that, that gets dismantled really by, you know, beginning to see the landscape as stratified, striated, contoured by relations of class and race. And also, I mean, just to kind of underscore the other thing you're saying, has it, Heather, that there's like this, there are these different modalities that we sometimes, you know, um, mash together of, you know, on the one hand, uh, work in, in uh, arts spaces or you know, communication within the academy where there is like more room to some extent for like ambiguity and messiness that's even seen as some as somewhat valuable, whereas you know, the question of like what strategies will get you where you need to go um, is is like a, a question more characteristic of activist spaces. Like I, I like that you kind of tease those apart because, you know, there's this 
tendency to imagine the academy as this like um, incubator for activism when, you know, it's not precisely that. And, and, you know, I guess to that end, I mean, I, I got so much uh, Mark out of your essay, Lubricity, Smooth Oils, Political Frictions, um, where you point out that uh, um, the way that we relate to uh, the landscape or, or kind of visualize the landscape is shot through with the kind of, um, you know, the PR strategies of like oil companies that have a kind of visual arsenal by which they produce a sense of smoothness, simplicity, a kind of patriotic optimism uh, that's largely meant to obscure these irreconcilable uh, environmental effects. And as you put it, you know, promote a quote, fantasy of a frictionless world contingent on the continued intensifying use of petrocarbons. Um, That kind of like regime of the visible is really interesting to me because like, you know, it's used clearly to marginalize all this evidence of ecocide. Uh, But, you know, you're, you're both making clear that in especially affluent settler colonial nations, we've largely gotten used to the infrastructural invisibilization of friction, of threats, um, you know, these risks, uh, it, you know, not not across the board, but, you know, in general, maybe that could be said. And like, you know, Heather, you write a lot about the site of the landfill in Plastic Matter, which you call, quote, a memorial to the act of forgetting. Um, and like, I was hoping we could talk about the points of contact between these two points. Like, on the one hand, Attempts by the oil industry to control perceptions of the natural world through a kind of corporate greenwashing. And on the other, efforts to kind of relegate these haunting sites of like overwhelming waste to the peripheries of our perception. Like, again, I guess in terms of the question of strategy and how we approach it, like, is it enough to expose like the mystifying effects of misrepresentation in the oil industry um, via public relations? Do we you know, do we need as like social theorists and people who care about these masked harms to create a means for people to perceive the stuff that most of us tend to be very attached to not perceiving? Um, And what sort of interventions do that work uh, in your experience? That's such a great question. And it's so hard. (laughs) (laughs) I I would say that I came to the work that I I have done for the last decade or so. sort of with the Petrocultures Research Group and the After Oil Collective Mm -hmm. with a a reasonably strong and I guess I would say, you know, uh, intellectually pessimistic, (laughs) willfully optimistic sense that that uh, defamiliarizing uh, modes of perception could make a real difference. And I might still hope that that's true, but it sort of feels a decade later, it's harder to, it's harder to feel that Mm. than it was then. And so then like, in some ways I just want to answer, no, I don't think, Mm. I don't think that that making those things visible is sufficient. And I'm, I'm thinking, as I say that, you know, of the story in the guardian yesterday that both of you may have seen about how Exxon knew in the seventies and predicted with remarkable uh, uh, prescience, exactly Mm -hmm. what is happening to the to the climate system now. Mm -hmm. And so that it's, you know, it's like that, you know, their, their models of, of anticipation were incredible Mm -hmm. and that will the news of this discovery, what does the news of this discovery do now for us? Yeah. Um, I don't know then if exposure does much in that register. It's like, it's, it's a intentionally uh, challenging thing. Like to, I guess, ask you to go back to this essay where you're doing like really stimulating work around trying to expose these strategies of mystification, right? Like literally animating the landscape in what ended up being kind of controversial ways in a way that like, you know, in ways that were controversial because of the deliberate ways that they were like obscuring the reality of, of, um, the effects of, uh, extraction, extractivism on the ground. Mm. But I guess, Heather, you know, like this question of the landfill is um, especially timely in this current moment where, um, you know, uh, uh, the the ongoing genocidal violence against missing and murdered indigenous women and girls is is coming to the foreground again in terms of politicizing um, the unwillingness of police to search a landfill um, in which um, it is known that it is very likely that the remains of, um, in, in some cases, unidentified indigenous women who have been murdered, 
uh, they, they, they may, you know, their remains might be located in these landfills. And this, you know, again, is a kind of haunting to find, to locate, to achieve closure by, um, you know, being able to mourn. The police are in some sense complicit with a system of invisibilization where the landfill, as you point out, is this memorial to an act of forgetting, a place where um, bodies are rendered um, inv- permanently invisible in this case, and cannot be exhumed because of the actual like petrocultural structure of these sites, right? As you point out, many of them being lined with uh, plastics, um, in some cases, this kind of heavy clay that encases them in these kind of units. I mean, in these moments where the disappearance, the, the destruction of indigenous, uh, the lives of indigenous women and girls is like, part of the national conversation, it is still seen as an insurmountable obstacle, the actual structure of these landfills in a world in which they are not meant to be visible at all. You know, when I heard about that, that particular landfill, um, it's just enraging. Like, it was just so enraging to hear that Mm -hmm. the police's response was that they would not go there because it was going to potentially be hazardous to their health. Yeah. Um, when the entire mechanism of the production of various kinds of landfills is occurring in relationship to the decimation of indigenous health. Mm -hmm. And so it just feels like, like it feels like that same kind of barricade mentality, like that white settler barricading mentality where like we can't, even expose ourselves even a little bit to potential toxicity that we have been benefiting from like for any any kind of of potential like closure for 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 the family members of 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 those of those women and girls who've who've gone missing and it just it's just so it's just enraging Mm -hmm. i think is like how i feel about it um I think what you're identifying is really important, which is that like, it really feels like it's like, you know, the landfill itself is built as this act of disappearing waste, disappearing toxicity, disappearing or naturalizing a forms of, of land based colonial violence. And then these women ending up in those places is both horrifying in and of itself, right? Cause it speaks mm-hmm. to the total disregard um, for their personhood. Um, for their lives, for their families, for who they're related to, for everyone who loved them. Um, but it also at the same time speaks to the ways of which it like, it just feels in some ways symbolic of the, of the kind of violence that the Canadian nation state is built upon. Um, and, and, and it, and it's like a condensation of that violence into like both the fact that they that their bodies might be there, but also the fact that that no one is even willing to go into those landfills. I do think that the police maybe rescinded that, but um, under because yeah, of the amount of I think public outrage exactly. around it. But uh, yeah. but it's just hor- Like it's just so. It's just yeah, it's just infuriating. And right. um, but I mean, back to sort of like what Mark you were saying earlier about like this kind of question of the relationship of demystification to activism. I mean, this is something that I struggle with a lot. And I think that I um, also have maybe ended up in a slightly more cynical place, which is that I'm not sure that the work of um, scholars and artists is really activist work. Like, I think it's more like work that allows us to deal with the emotional and intellectual sense of complicity, sense of complicatedness, sense of discord, sense of ambivalence, all of these things that I don't think are properly um, a part of a kind of activist arena I, that that maybe allow us to to sort of deal with the with the difficulty and the kind of fullness of being in the world um, and give language to that. Like I think that you know, like your article on lubricity, I really love because I think it really helps to um, describe the ways in which oil does create this kind of smoothness to our lives, right? And I think that that kind of description is incredibly helpful in terms of kind of analytic mode, in terms of understanding ourselves and our places in the world. Um, but I agree that I'm not sure that there's like a direct relationship between that and kind of like actual change. Um, 
or there's not, or I think the relationship between those things is not immediate or obvious um, and is highly contingent upon a number of, of other factors. Um, but I also think that, that maybe that's okay, that maybe that there are ways in which, you know, like we're people who exist in the world, right? We have these professional practices, but many people in the academy also have other kinds of practices. And I think it's okay for, for there to be multiple different ways in which we engage um, as academics and as people in the world where some of it is maybe more policy oriented or, um, you know, direct action oriented. And some of it is, is providing space for the complexity of what it means to be living in these systems. Mm -hmm. I'm still sort of turning over and, and, and enjoying the, the, I, th I think you used the phrase "low hanging data fruit," <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. where it was something like that about about and 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 one of the things that I love about that is that it sort of suggests that there's a way of doing particular forms of activist work that are as much about making it impossible to disavow mm -hmm. the results of the action as anything else, right? And it feels like this is kind of like this is you know th this question about disavowal around around the landfill uh, feels mm -hmm. like it's, it is so harrowing and so infuriating and produces rage. And then it's hard to know what to do with that rage. And, and I, I think as, as I'm thinking, so I love in the book, the way you sort of ask us to think about the landfill as a kind of, what, do, what if we thought about it as a, as a, an artistic installation? What, what do you think mm -hmm. of it as, as relational art? Um, I think that that's so, that's so disturbing and wonderful. <laughs> um, but it makes me think in turn of, so Jennifer Wenzel, the, the, uh, uh, comparatist and energy humanist has this really great short piece, um, at the end of an issue of uh, postmodern culture called, uh, uh, on overburden, uh, in which she talks about the relationship of waste as sort of refuse or that, which is left behind to waste as prospect. And so as proleptic, as the thing with which we could do other things. And it feels as though, you know, the settler colonial state treats waste as a thing with which it could do other things, in which case, in, in this case, to disavow any kind of responsibility to act on settler colonial crime. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so I, I just think that, that's, that, that that idea about the sort of low-hanging data fruit is really compelling in relation to sort of forcing into a kind of visibility those things which otherwise are, are obscured or occluded. And, you know, the, um, the, the work that you've done is about trying to provide us with this like, um, material foundation for, you know, I think unseating what you call the hubris of plastic, right? Like, um, there are these gestures to the, toward trying to kind of like, um, undermine that and say like, ultimately, as you say, it returns to the earth, you know, it doesn't provide protection if anything, um, it, it backfires and provides the opposite of protection and contamination. And, and there is this like way in which there's like, um, a, a belief that the kind of horror and terror, the anxiety, all this stuff is kind of bubbling over into, uh, a moment where there's, there's a level of disillusionment about the promises of plastic, even if it's inescapable, like still that affective condition of disillusionment is sort of vital in the sense of, you know, uh, um, undoing the um the specific kind of like association with plastic of of you know creative force of endless possibility of limitlessness um we're colliding with precisely those limits and the idea in some ways seems to be like how do we embrace those limits how do we educate ourselves and others and how to embrace those limits there's a level of like wonder in the in 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 your work both of you um that is important in terms of trying to give us a space for embracing limits in a in a joyful almost kind of way where yes we're bombarded by uh what i think you call like an apocalyptic nihilism um that sees no possibility of a future we ought to experience a level of wonder at the as you put it the asymmetrical dependence of humans on the earth you know no one knows how to uh, replace the life-giving systems that the that the earth provides for free um, and yet it seems that you know um, we're still mostly attached to technological solutions rather than trying to embrace as it were these kinds of uh, limits I guess you know this is just a roundabout way of asking not precisely the question of where you find hope 
but where you still experience a level of wonder um, and 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 a connection, I guess, a sense of kinship with the earth that might be potentially a source of some kind of tentative optimism <laughs> at the very least. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's such a good and vital question and also like, again, a really difficult one. Um, but I mean, I think I find that sense of wonder as you're putting it um, pretty regularly, actually. And, mm. and I think like, um, just it's like, it's pretty remarkable, like how quickly our bodies or ecosystems or even species um, will regenerate if given the right conditions. Right. Um, and I think it's endlessly remarkable to me how fast that can happen. And, um, and even with something like all of these various forms of um, plastic eating bacteria um, or fungi, um, like it's remarkable to me that they, that they have developed so quickly as well, right? And mm. and I and I have no reason to believe that that won't continue proliferating at a at, at a at a fairly rapid rate, which doesn't. Neither one of those things. I think the problem with 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 these things is that they get so quickly co-opted into the kind of um, smoothness or impasse or the other kinds of terms that you're talking about, Mark, and the ways in which you've analyzed petrocultures, right? Like they get so quickly turned around and used against the vitality of those systems. And I think that that is what um, is so deeply frustrating. And the amount, but, but also like sometimes it's just so frustrating to see the amount of effort, the amount of genocidal, ecocidal effort that is being put into um, the world and even if we just lessened that effort, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like that, that things would be so much better, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and it, it, it's, um, but yeah, I mean, I think like almost everywhere I turn, there's sort of like reason for wonderment, um, even in relationship to, you know, and Mark, I think you, you identified this earlier about the kind of differential, um, asymmetrical access to the relationship of crisis, right? Mm -hmm. Which you were drawing upon, um, or I'm, I'm assuming, assuming in part you're thinking about, again, Kyle Powell's White or other folks who've really like written about the ways in which the kinds of, of ecocidal, genocidal practices um, that we're really, that we're really butting up against now on, in these really spectacular ways, um, these globally spectacular ways um, have been in existence for a very long time. And so I do think that there's also, like, there's also a, a way to approach this in a kind of humble manner of being like, well, there's many people and many species who have lived through moments that look very similar to this. Um, and so what, what can we do about it? Um, but it also is just so, it's just so frustrating to see, um, yeah, like it's just the, the, the complete kind of in action in relationship to kind of like, um, I think I think one of the things that's very difficult, um, I think, to wrap for me um, as somebody who works in academia is like is the is understanding that like knowledge does not necessarily mean things will change. Right. In fact, knowledge might right. mean that things are actually just going to be hidden more adeptly, um, which is what we what we saw with with Exxon. It's what we've seen with DuPont in relationship to PFAS or with um, relationship to endocrine disrupting chemicals, which they've known about since the 30s and 50s, basically immediately upon their production. Mm -hmm. That Those things were known about them. They were known that they were toxic from the get go. There was never any moment where that was ambiguous. And I think that, that that's the kind of thing that's like deeply frustrating. And so and so it like it then leads you to think like, OK, what are the other types of interventions that can be made? Because clearly that is that is not necessarily the one that is going to do anything. Um, although, you know, to be fair, most of those documents were internal and the, the broader public didn't necessarily know. But, but, um, but I think that, that kind of question of wonder is also incredibly important because I do think that there is a sense that we need to have some idea of what we're fighting for and not just what we're fighting against. And, um, 
And that to me is also the place where like, where artistic production can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Mar Mark, you've written, you, like over and over again, it seems to come up in your writing this idea of like the emergence of a mood. You use that term from time to time or a structure of feeling like that seems to me to be a little bit of an attempt to shift away from just merely focusing on like knowledge. I was moved by, you know, this moment, Heather, where you talk about w the fact that, you know, quote, which of us will suffer and how that suffering is regulated or managed is the political question of our times. Um, you know, that that mood of, as it were, a kind of like mourning or reckoning, um, that's a different state than just merely like knowing or being burdened with knowledge, you know? I mean, I, the, the, I, I come to the, to the sort of idea of mood through the work of the queer theorist uh, uh, Jonathan Flatley, mm -hmm. um, who has written really powerfully about, you know, what he calls a revolutionary mood. And he's writing about it in the context of like worker struggles, black worker struggles in Detroit in the 60s. And he, he has compelling ways of sort of talking about how you know, you're never not in a mood and moods are never just yours. They're, they're bigger than you. Mm -hmm. And that then what does it mean to sort of shift the mood and what happens in the context of that, particularly for in moments of struggle. Mm -hmm. And I, and for me, a thing that that sort of connects to, which is, I, it feels like it's a kind of, it's a, it's a kind of small way to think about what makes me hopeful or gives me wonder. But I would say that it's sort of, you know, I found the the kinds of work that I've done on, or, or, the, or the conversations that I've engaged with about petroculture over the last decades have have always involved uh, pretty large collaborations, mm -hmm. and that's been kind of a change in my practice, and and has been like a wonderful discovery for me. And one of the things that I love about collaboration is that it sort of constantly confronts me with my own limits and requires that I sort of understand solidarities. Yeah, yeah. And it's unfortunately too seldom the case that, you know, especially in the humanities, we do like work collaboratively. So like the discovery in some sense of that power of the ability to collaborate uh, in indeterminate ways is super exciting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much to both of you. This has been fantastic. Thank you. And th Scott, this is for organizing it and for such terrific questions. And thank you, Heather, for such a stimulating conversation. It's really amazing. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you both so much. I mean, Marcus, it's like such a pleasure to be in dialogue with you. And like, yeah, thank you so much, um, Scott, for organizing this. It's like just really been, been such a pleasure to get to talk about these ideas with both of you. And for such incredible questions and such thoughtful responses, Mark. I really always enjoy learning from you, so very grateful to both of you.